Part the Third, Euphorbia, Section Two of Thais by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Euphorbia, Section Two. The days passed, and the saint still lived on his pillar. When the rainy season came, the waters of heaven filtering through the cracks in the roof wetted his body. His stiff limbs were incapable of movement. Scorched by the sun and reddened by the dew, his skin broke. Large ulcers devoured his arms and legs. But the desire of Thais still consumed him inwardly. And he cried, It is not enough, great God, more temptations, more unclean thoughts, more horrible desires. Lord, lay upon me all the lusts of men, that I may expiate them all. Though it is false that the Greek bitch took upon herself all the sins of the world, as I heard an impostor once declare, yet there is a hidden meaning in the fable, the truth of which I now recognize. For it is true that the sins of the people enter the soul of the saints, and are lost there as in a well. Thus it is that the souls of the just are polluted with more filth than is ever found in the soul of the sinner. And for that reason I praise thee, O my God, for having made me the cesspool of the world. One day a rumor ran through the holy city, and even reached the ears of the hermit. A very great personage, a man occupying a high position, the prefect of the Alexandrian fleet, Lucius Aurelius Cotta, was about to visit the city, was indeed now on his way. The news was true. Old Cotta, who was inspecting the canals and the navigation of the Nile, had many times expressed a desire to see the stylite and the new city, to which the name of Stylopolis had been given. The Stylopolitans saw the river covered with sails one morning. Cotta appeared on board a golden galley hung with purple and followed by all his fleet. He landed and advanced, accompanied by a secretary carrying his tablets, and Aristaeus, his physician, with whom he liked to converse. A numerous suite walked behind him, and the shore was covered with latclaves and military uniforms. He stopped some paces from the column and began to examine the stylite, wiping his face, meanwhile, with the skirt of his toga. Being of a naturally curious disposition, he had observed many things in the course of his long voyages. He liked to remember them, and intended to write, after he had finished his Punic history, a book on the remarkable things he had witnessed. He seemed much interested by the spectacle before him. "'This is very curious,' he said, puffing and blowing, and, which is a circumstance worthy of being recorded, this man was my guest. Yes, this monk supped with me last year, after which he carried off an actress. Turning to his secretary, Note that, my son, on my tablets, also the dimensions of the column, not omitting the shape of the top of it. Then, wiping his face again, Persons deserving of belief have assured me that this monk has not left his column for a single moment since he mounted it a year ago. Is that possible, Aristaeus? That which is possible to a lunatic or a sick man, replied Aristaeus, would be impossible to a man sound in body and mind. Do you know, Lucius, that sometimes diseases of the mind or body give to those afflicted by them a strength which healthy men do not possess? For, as a matter of fact, there is no such thing as good health or bad health. There are only different conditions of the organs. Having studied what are called maladies, I have come to consider them as necessary forms of life. I take pleasure in studying them in order to be able to conquer them. Some of them are worthy of admiration, 
and conceal under apparent disorder profound harmonies for instance a quartan fever is certainly a very pretty thing sometimes certain affections of the body cause a rapid augmentation of the faculties of the mind you know creon when he was a child he stuttered and was stupid but having cracked his skull by tumbling off a ladder he became an able lawyer as you are aware this monk must be affected in some hidden organ moreover this kind of existence is not so extraordinary as it appears to you lucius i may remind you that the gymnosophists of india can remain motionless not merely for a year but during twenty thirty or forty years by jupiter cried cotta that is a strange madness for man was born to move and act and idleness is an unpardonable crime because it is an injury to the state i do not know of any religion in which such an objectionable practice is permitted though it possibly may be in some of the asiatic creeds when i was governor of syria i found folly erected in the porches at the city of hera a man ascended twice a year and remained there for a week the people believed that this man talked with the gods and interceded with them for the prosperity of syria the custom appeared senseless to me nevertheless i did nothing to put it down for i consider that a functionary ought not to interfere with the matters and customs of the people but on the contrary to see that they are preserved it is not the business of the government to force a religion on a people but to maintain that which exists which whether good or bad has been regulated by the spirit of the time the place and the race if it endeavors to put down a religion it proclaims itself revolutionary in spirit and tyrannical in its acts and is justly detested besides how are you to raise yourself above the superstitions of the vulgar except by understanding them and tolerating them aristaeus i am of the opinion that i should leave this nephilocasigian in the air exposed only to the indignities the birds shower on him i should not gain anything by having him pulled down but i should by taking note of his thoughts and beliefs he puffed and coughed and placed his hand on the secretary's shoulder my child note down that amongst certain sects of christians it is considered praiseworthy to carry off courtesans and to live upon columns you may add that these customs are evidence of the worship of genetic divinities but at this point we ought to question him himself then raising his head and shading his eyes with his hand to keep off the sun he shouted Hallo, Paphnutius! If you remember that you were once my guest, answer me. What are you doing up there? Why did you go up? And why do you stay there? Has this column any phallic signification in your mind? Paphnutius, considering Cotta as nothing but an idolater, did not deign to reply. But his disciple, Flavian, approached and said, Illustrious sir, this holy man takes the sins of the world upon him and cures diseases. By Jupiter, do you hear, Aristaeus? cried Cotta. This Nephilocosigian practices medicine, like you. What do you think of so high a rival? Aristaeus shook his head. It is very possible that he may cure certain diseases better than I can, such, for instance, as epilepsy, vulgarly called the divine malady, although all maladies are equally divine, for they all come from the gods. But the cause of this disease lies partly in the imagination, 
and you must confess, Lucius, that this monk perched up on the head of a goddess strikes the minds of uh, the sick people more forcibly than I, bending over my mortars and files in my laboratory, could ever do. There are forces, Lucius, infinitely more powerful than reason and science. What are they? asked Cotta. Ignorance and folly, replied Aristeus. I have rarely seen a more curious sight, continued Cotta, and that some day an able writer will relate the foundation of Stylopolis, but even the most extraordinary spectacles should not keep, longer than is befitting, a serious and busy man from his work. Let us go and inspect the canals. Farewell, good Puff Nutius, or rather, till our next meeting. If ever you should come down to earth again, and revisit Alexandria, do not fail to come and sup with me. These words, heard by all present, passed from mouth to mouth, and being repeated by the believers, added greatly to the reputation of Paphnutius. Pious minds amplified and transformed them, and it was stated that Paphnutius, from the top of his pillar, had converted the prefect of the fleet to the faith of the apostles and the Nicene fathers. The believers found a figurative meaning in the last words uttered by Aurelius Cotta. To them, the supper to which this important personage had invited the ascetic was a holy communion, a spiritual repast, a celestial banquet. The story of this meeting was embroidered with wonderful details, which those who invented were the first to believe. It was said that when Cotta, after a long argument, had embraced the truth, an angel had come from heaven to wipe the sweat from his brow. The physician and secretary of the prefect of the fleet had also, it was asserted, been converted at the same time. And the miracle being public and notorious, the deacons of the principal churches of Libya recorded it amongst the authentic facts. After that, it could be said without any exaggeration that the whole world was seized with a desire to see Paphnutius, and that, in the West as well as the East, all Christians turned their astonished eyes toward him. The most celebrated cities of Italy sent deputations to him, and the Roman Caesar, the divine Constantine who favored the Christian religion, wrote him a letter which the legates brought to him with great ceremony. But one night, whilst the budding city at his feet slept in the dew, he heard a voice which said, Paphnutius, thou art become celebrated by thy works and powerful by thy word. God has raised thee up for his glory. He has chosen thee to work miracles, heal the sick, convert the pagans, enlighten the sinners, confound the Arians, and establish peace in the church. Paphnutius replied, God's will be done. The voice continued, Arise, Paphnutius, and go seek in his palace the impious Constans, who, far from imitating the wisdom of his brother Constantine, inclines to the errors of Arius and Marcus. Go! The bronze gates shall fly open before thee, and thy sandals shall resound on the golden floor of the basilica before the throne of the Caesars, and thy awe-inspiring voice shall change the heart of the son of Constantinus. Thou shalt reign over a peaceful and powerful church, and even as the soul directs the body, so shall the church govern the empire. Thou shalt be placed above the senators, committees, and patricians. Thou shalt repress the greed of the people, and check the boldness of the barbarians. Old Kata, knowing that thou art the head of the government, will seek the honor of washing thy feet. At thy death, 
thy Cilicium shall be taken to the patriarch of Alexandria, and the great Athanasius, white with glory, shall kiss it as a relic of the saint. Go! Paphnutius replied, Let the will of God be accomplished. And making an effort to stand up, he prepared to descend, but the voice, divining his intention, said, Above all, descend not by the ladder. That would be to act like an ordinary man, and to be unconscious of the gifts that are in thee. A great saint like thee ought to fly through the air. Leap! The angels are there to support thee. Leap, then! Paphnutius replied, the will of God be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Extending his long arms like the ragged wings of a huge, sick bird, he was about to throw himself down, when suddenly a hideous mocking laugh rang in his ears. Terrified, he asked, Who laughs thus? Ah, ah, screamed a voice. We are yet but at the beginning of our friendship. Thou wilt some day be better acquainted with me. My friend, it was I who caused thee to ascend here, and I ought to be satisfied at the docility with which thou hast accomplished my wishes. Paphnutius, I am pleased with thee. Paphnutius murmured in a voice stifled by fear, Avant! Avant, I know thee now. Thou art he who carried Jesus to a pinnacle of a temple and showed him all the kingdoms of this world. He fell, affrighted, on the stone. Why did I not know this sooner, he thought. More wretched than the blind, deaf, and paralyzed who trust in me, I have lost all knowledge of things supernatural and am more depraved than the maniacs who eat earth and approach dead bodies. I can no longer distinguish between the clamors of hell and the voices of heaven. I have lost even the intuition of the newborn child who cries when its nurse's breast is taken from it, of the dog that scents out its master's footsteps, of the plant that turns towards the sun. I am the laughing stock of the devils. So then, it is Satan who led me here. When he elevated me on this pedestal, lust and pride mounted with me. It is not the magnitude of my temptations which terrifies me. Antony on his mountains suffers the same. I wish that all their swords may pierce my flesh before the eyes of the angels, I have even learned to like my sufferings, but God does not speak to me, and his silence astonishes me. He has left me, and I had but him to look to. He leaves me alone in the horror of his absence. He flies from me. I will follow after him. This stone burns my feet. Let me leave quickly and come up with God." With that, he seized the ladder which stood against the column, put his feet on it, and having descended a rung, found himself face to face with the monster's head. She smiled strangely. He was certain then that what he had taken for the sight of his rest and glory was but the diabolical instrument of his trouble and damnation. He hastily descended and touched the soil. His feet had forgotten their use, and he reeled. But, feeling on him the shadow of the cursed column, he forced himself to run. All slept. He traversed, without being seen, the great square surrounded by wine shops, inns, and caravanserias, and threw himself into a by-street, which led towards the Libyan hills. A dog pursued him barking, and stopped only at the edge of the desert. Paphnutius went through a country where there was no road but the trail of wild beasts. Leaving behind him the huts abandoned by the coiners, he continued all night and all day his solitary flight. At last, 
almost ready to expire with hunger, thirst, and fatigue, and not knowing if God was still far from him, he came to a silent city, which extended from right to left, and stretched away till it was lost in the blue horizon. The buildings, which were widely separated, and like each other, resembled pyramids cut off at half their height. They were tombs. The doors were broken, and in the shadow of the chambers could be seen the gleaming eyes of hyenas and wolves who brought forth their young there, whilst the dead bodies lay on the threshold, despoiled by robbers and gnawed by the wild beasts. Having passed through this funeral city, Paphnutius fell exhausted before a tomb which stood near a spring surrounded by palm trees. This tomb was much ornamented, and, as there was no door to it, he saw inside it a painted chamber in which serpents bred. Here, he sighed, is the abode I have chosen, the tabernacle of my repentance and penitence. He dragged himself to it, drove out the reptiles with his feet, and remained prostrate on the stone floor for eighteen hours, at the end of which time he went to the spring and drank out of his hand. Then he plucked some dates and some stalks of lotus, the seeds of which he ate. Thinking this kind of life was good, he made it the rule of his existence. From morning to night, he never lifted his forehead from the stone. One day, whilst he was thus prostrated, he heard a voice which said, Look at these images that thou mayst learn. Then, raising his head, he saw on the walls of the chamber paintings which represented lively and domestic scenes. They were a very old work and marvelously lifelike. There were cooks who blew the fire, with their cheeks all puffed out, others plucked geese or cooked quarters of sheep in stew pans. A little farther, a hunter carried on his shoulders a gazelle, pierced with arrows. In one place, peasants were sowing, reaping, or gathering. In another, women danced to the sounds of viols, flutes, and harp. A young girl played the therable. The lotus flower shone in her hair, which was neatly braided. Her transparent dress let the pure forms of her body be seen. Her bosom and mouth were perfect. The face was turned in profile, and the beautiful eye looked straight before her. The whole figure was exquisite. Paphnutius, having examined it, lowered his eyes and replied to the voice, why dost thou command me to look at these images? No doubt they represent the terrestrial life of the idolater whose body rests here, under my feet, at the bottom of a well, in a coffin of black basalt. They recall the life of a dead man, and are, despite their bright colors, the shadows of a shadow. The life of a dead man, oh, vanity! He is dead, but he lived, replied the voice, and thou wilt die, and wilt not have lived. From that day Paphnutius had not a moment's rest. The voice spoke to him incessantly. The girl with the therable looked fixedly at him from underneath the long lashes of her eye. At last she also spoke. Look! I am mysterious and beautiful. Love me. Exhaust in my arms the love which torments you. What use is it to fear me? You cannot escape me. I am the beauty of woman. Whither do you think to fly from me, senseless fool? You will find my likeness in the radiancy of flowers, and in the grace of the palm trees, in the flight of pigeons, in the bounds of the gazelle, in the rippling of brooks, in the soft light of the moon. And if you close your eyes, you will find me within yourself. 
It is a thousand years since the man who sleeps here, swathed in linen, in a bed of black stone, pressed me to his heart. It is a thousand years since he received the last kiss from my mouth, and his sleep is yet redolent with it. You know me well, Paphnutius. How is it you have not recognized me? I am one of the innumerable incarnations of Thais. You are a learned monk and well skilled in the knowledge of things. You have traveled, and it is by travel a man learns the most. Often a day passed abroad will show more novelties than ten years passed at home. You heard that Thais lived formerly in Argos under the name of Helen. She had another existence in Thebes, Hecatompile. And I was Thais of Thebes. How is it you have not guessed it? I took, when I was alive, a large share in the sins of this world, and now, reduced here to the condition of a shadow, I am still quite capable of taking your sins upon me, beloved monk. Whence comes your surprise? It was certain that, wherever you went, you would find Thais again. He struck his forehead against the pavement and uttered a cry of terror, and every night the player of the Theorbo left the wall, approached him, and spoke in a clear voice mingled with soft breathing, and as the holy man resisted the temptation she gave him, she said to him, Love me, yield, friend, as long as you resist me, I shall torment you. You do not know what the patience of a dead woman is. I shall wait, if necessary, till you are dead. Being a sorceress, I shall put into your lifeless body a spirit who will reanimate it, and who will not refuse me what I have asked in vain of you. And think, Puffnutius, what a strange situation, when your blessed soul sees, from the height of heaven, its own body given up to sin. God, who has promised to return you to this body after the day of judgment and the end of time, will himself be much puzzled. How can he place in celestial glory a human form inhabited by a devil and guarded by a sorceress? You have not thought of that difficulty, nor God either, perhaps. Between ourselves, he is not very knowing. Any ordinary magician can easily deceive him, and if he had not his thunder and the cataracts of heaven, the village urchins would pull his beard. He has certainly not as much sense as the old serpent, his adversary. He, indeed, is a beautiful artist. If I am so beautiful, it is because he adorned me with all my attractions. It was he who taught me how to braid my hair and to make myself rosy fingers with agate nails. You have misunderstood him. When you came out to live in this tomb, you drove out with your feet the serpents which were here, without troubling yourself to know whether they were of his family, and you crushed their eggs. I am afraid, my poor friend, you will have a troublesome business on your hands. You were warned, however, that he was a musician and a lover. What have you done? You have quarreled with science and beauty. You are altogether miserable, and Yahweh does not come to your help. It is not probable that he will come. Being as great as all things, he cannot move for want of space. And if, by an impossibility, he made the least movement, all creation would be pushed out of place. My handsome hermit, give me a kiss. Paphnutius was aware that great prodigies are performed by magic arts. He thought not without much uneasiness. Perhaps the dead man buried at my feet knows the words written in that mysterious book which exists hidden not far from here at the bottom of a royal tomb. 
By virtue of these words, the dead, taking the form which they had upon earth, see the light of the sun and the smiles of women. His chief fear was that the girl with the theorbo and the dead man might come together, as they did in their lifetime, and that he should see them unite. Sometimes, he thought, he heard the sound of kissing. He was troubled in his mind, and now, in the absence of God, he feared to think as much as to feel. One evening, when he was kneeling, prostrate according to his custom, an unknown voice said to him, Paphnutius, there are on earth more people than you imagine, and if I were to show you what I have seen, you would die of astonishment. There are men with a single eye in the middle of their forehead. There are men who have but one leg and advance by jumps. There are men who change their sex, and the females become males. There are men trees who shoot out roots in the ground, and there are men with no head, with two eyes, a nose, and a mouth in their breast. Can you honestly believe that Jesus Christ died for the salvation of these men? Another time he had a vision. He saw in a strong light a broad road, rivulets and gardens. On the road, Aristobulus and Chariots passed at a gallop on their Syrian horses, and the joyous ardor of the race reddened the cheeks of the two young men. Beneath a portico, Callicrates recited his verses, satisfied pride, trembled in his voice, and shone in his eyes. In the garden, Xenothemus picked apples of gold, and caressed the serpent with azure wings. Cloud in white, and wearing a shining mitre, Hemodorus meditated beneath a sacred parousia, which bore, instead of flowers, small heads of pure profile, wearing, like the Egyptian goddess, vultures, hawks, or the shining disk of the moon. Whilst, in the background, by the side of a fountain, Nicias studied on an armillary sphere the harmonious movements of the stars. Then a veiled woman approached the monk, holding in her hand a branch of myrtle. She said to him, Look, some seek eternal beauty, and place their ephemeral life in the infinite. Others live without much thought, but by that alone they submit to fair nature, and they are happy and beautiful in the joy of living only, and give glory to the supreme artist of all things, for man is a noble hymn to God. All think that happiness is innocent, and that pleasure is permitted to man. Paphnutius, if they are right, what a dupe you have been! And the vision vanished. Thus was Paphnutius tempted unceasingly in body and mind. Satan never gave him a minute's repose. The solitude of the tomb was more peopled than the streets of a great city. The devils shouted with laughter, and millions of imps, evil genii, and phantoms imitated all the ordinary transactions of life. In the evening, when he went to the spring, satyrs and nymphs capered around him, and they tried to drag him into their lascivious dances. The demons no longer feared him. They loaded him with insults, obscene jests, and blows. One day a devil, no longer than his arm, stole the cord he wore around his waist. He said to himself, Thought, whither hast thou led me? And he resolved to work with his hands, in order to give his mind that rest of which it had need. Near the spring, some banana trees with large leaves grew under the shade of the palms. He cut the stalks and carried them to the tomb. He crushed them with a stone and reduced them to fibers as he had seen rope makers do, for he intended to make a cord to replace that which the devil had stolen. The demons were somewhat displeased at this. They ceased their clamor, and the girl with the theorbo no longer continued her magic arts, but remained quietly on the wall. 
the courage and faith of Paphnutius increased whilst he pounded the banana stems. With heaven's help, he said to himself, I shall subdue the flesh. As to my soul, its confidence is still unshaken. In vain do the devils and that accursed woman try to instill into my mind doubts as to the nature of God. I will reply to them by the mouth of the Apostle John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. That I firmly believe, and that which I believe is absurd, I believe still more firmly. In fact, it should be absurd. If it were not so, I should not believe. I should know. And it is not that which we know which gives eternal life. It is faith only that saves. He exposed the separated fibers to the sun and the dew, and every morning he took care to turn them to prevent them rotting, and he rejoiced to find that he had become as simple as a child. When he had twisted his cord, he cut reeds to make mats and baskets. The sepulchral chamber resembled a basket-maker's workshop, and Paphnutius could pass without difficulty from work to prayer. Yet still God was not merciful to him, for one night he was awakened by a voice which froze him with horror, for he guessed that it was the voice of the dead man. The voice called quickly in a light whisper, Helen, Helen, come and bathe with me, come quickly. A woman, whose mouth was close to the monk's ears, replied, Friend, I cannot rise. A man is lying on me. Paphnutius suddenly perceived that his cheek rested on a woman's breast. He recognized the player of the therabo, who, partly relieved of his weight, raised her breast. He clung tightly to the sweet, warm, perfumed body and consumed with the desire of damnation, he cried, Stay, stay, my heavenly one. But she was already standing on the threshold. She laughed, and her smile gleamed in the silver rays of the moon. Why should I stay, she said. The shadow of a shadow is enough for a lover endowed with such a lively imagination. Besides, you have sinned. What more was needed? Paphnutius wept in the night, and when the dawn came, he murmured a prayer that was a meek complaint. Jesus, my Jesus, why hast thou forsaken me? Thou seest the danger in which I am. Come and help me, sweet Savior. Since thy father no longer loves me, and does not hear me, remember that I have but thee. From him nothing is to be hoped. I cannot comprehend him, and he cannot pity me. But thou was born of a woman, and that is why I trust in thee. Remember that thou wast a man. I pray to thee, not because thou art God of God, light of light, very God of very God, but because thou hast lived poor, and humble on this earth where I now suffer. Because Satan has tempted thy flesh, because the sweat of agony has bedewed thy face, it is to thy humanity that I pray, Jesus, my brother, Jesus. When he had thus prayed, wringing his hands, a terrible peal of laughter shook the walls of the tomb, and the voice which rang in his ears on the top of the column said jeeringly, That is a prayer worthy of the breviary of Marcus, the heretic. Paphnutius is an Arian. Paphnutius is an Arian. As though thunderstruck, the monk fell senseless. End of Part the Third, Euphorbia, Section 2